in the presentation. Um, you can type any questions that may pop into your head uh, in the comment section or in the chat section. Uh, was it? There will be a poll opening at the end. Please uh, take time to fill that out. Um, and the videos are available on the Grand Lodge YouTube um, page. So there's an upcoming schedule. There's going to be a part three to this, uh, which will be done next Wednesday. Uh, then we've got a Grandmaster's q and I hope uh, Wolf Worshipful Ralph is uh, ready for that one. And then five lessons I learned from my kids by uh, Worshipful Brother Bradley Phelps. Um, the show and tell challenge is still going on. Uh, please submit a video, essay, poetry, anything that will answer the questions listed below. What is Freemasonry in Minnesota? What will your life and legacy say about Freemasonry? And how will you help others find their way to the rewards of the craft? Um, the website is listed below. It's also available through the eMason. And then the Grand Lodge Mentoring Committee will have a jump starting mentoring seminar on May 1st. Um, that registration is listed below as well. And I'm going to jump in and say the tickets for that uh, in person close uh, wrap up on Friday. So if you want to attend the in person session, please be sure to get registered before the end of day on Friday. Perfect. And then there's a call for presenters. So if you have a topic that you would like to uh, present at an upcoming uh, webinar series, these ones being held on Wednesdays, uh, please send your topic to the Grand Lodge Mentoring Committee. Um, there's the email and the phone number below. Um, so looking for presenters to uh, keep this thing going. Now, without further ado, Deism and the Religious Philosophy of Freemasonry, Part 2, by Most Worshipful Brother, Terry Tilton. Thank you very much. Let's get to a screen here and we'll get started. Let's see if that one comes up. There we go. Well, a joy to be with you again, uh, my brothers, tonight. Uh, going to uh, share a little uh, review of what we talked about last week, especially for those that were not with us previously. And then want to answer uh, one question that had come in. And uh, then we'll go uh, finish up this topic in terms of uh, the founders of the craft tonight. So let's uh, be get started. And if I can figure out, there we go. That's a picture of me. Well, not a very recent picture either, but that's okay. Um, but uh, the good news is uh, glad to be with you tonight and uh, share this presentation. Uh, let's see here. What happened here? Is this starting the, from the beginning? Oh, no, 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 no. Ah, we're in the wrong spot. <laughs> Why did it pull up this one? Okay. Oh, I know, because I didn't start in the right spot. Let me uh, go down to uh, where I need to go here. Just give me a second. I, I, this is all on, uh, is all on a, uh, uh, just the same PowerPoint program. I just have to start in a different place. It's my fault that I didn't uh, get down there far enough. So let's just start where the right spot is there. Okay. So now we're back to where we need to go and I need to, get into viewing. Let's see here. This uh, top thing here. Oh, there it is. Select from current. Yeah, I can, I, can, I can move it. Yeah, right. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, I could do that. Slide and see if it goes from, from current slide. Right. Let's try that. Okay, there we go. Move this back up to the top here so I can see a little bit more. And Tim wants to get in. All right. Let's, um, oh, shucks. Uh, how do I go back? That's the next problem. I was going to. Never fails when you want to do something, you got to get it right here. So let's go back to where we start. Let's start right here. Current slide. There we go. Uh, just a little summary then uh, of what we discussed uh, last week on uh, deism and a little bit of background. Uh, when we think of deism, the founder of deism, at least the father of modern deism and English deism, is uh, Lord uh, Edward Herbert Sherberry. Uh, he uh, lived in the uh, 17th century, died by uh, 1680, 
but uh, his writings form the basis of the progression of what was a less dogmatic start uh, to this religious philosophy. We'll talk about the more dogmatic part tonight. His writings along most especially with John Locke, who was at the end of the 17th century, proved tremendously influential. Deism eventually would spread, of course, to many different countries. Uh, I'm just going to do a couple of summary points here. And, and uh, the classical points of Herbert de Sherber, of, of Sherbury are significant. Uh, they uh, are significant for a lot of reasons, but I want to remind us of them. There is one supreme God. He is to be worshipped. Uh, virtue and piety are the chief parts of divine worship. We ought to be sorry for our sins and repent of them, and divine goodness uh, and divine goodness doth dispense both reward and punishments in this life and the life to come. And you'll recall my comment was that, in fact, our landmarks uh, in um, uh, most of masonry, the traditional landmarks, cover most of these points as the landmarks of the craft. We'll talk about that a little later on, too. The origins of deism uh, obviously was directly a, a product of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment uh, was uh, in the 16 and 1700s for the most part as an intellectual movement that championed human reason and scientific thinking uh, and what was called at that time natural philosophy. The Enlightenment is closely tied to the scientific revolution of the 16th or 18th centuries. Uh, in gaining an understanding of science, increasingly uh, uh, the learned people of that age became more suspicious or skeptical of traditional religious teachings. Many intellectuals of the Enlightenment considered so much of traditional Christianity as superstition. And I listed uh, some questions that, that were often raised. How could Moses have parted the sea? How could Jesus have raised a man from the dead? Uh, contrary to science, they must be myths. How can we... Many Enlightenment intellectuals certainly thought so. And um, the, although they were not prepared to, uh, to affirm the, uh, atheism, belief that God does not exist, uh, deism developed as a theological approach that affirmed God's existence, but denied supernatural ex occurrences. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Deism then is commonly understood as the theological view that affirms, affirms the existence of God but denies miraculous occurrences. Deists often compare God to a clockmaker. That's often the analogy that is found in reading. Just as a clockmaker creates a clock and winds it up and lets it operate, God too created the world and let it operate according to natural law. Deism places high importance on scientific theory, regards supernatural occurrences as possible. Deist view, God exists, but does not interact personally with the universe. Deism also places a high value on human reason and uh, as well. Typically, a deist would regard Bible stories containing miracles as little more than myths. <clears throat> John Locke uh, became the uh, individual who uh, began a more radical understanding of um, uh, uh, of uh, his, his uh, thought radically uh, made it was a dividing point between the more modern deism of the previous period and a radical or a fundamentalist or, a tradi or much more uh, uh, classical understanding of deism. Uh, his first conclusion about deism is that God exists as creator of the universe and all that is in it, and that this supreme being is unknowable, omniscient, and incomprehensible. Um, and that is probably the closest uh, definition that uh, I can give to a summation of what deism believes. Uh, radical enlightenment deism, uh, a radical enlightenment with the classical sense of deism uh, is a period that roughly spans 50 years. Uh, and again, uh, just reminding you that deism is a belief that God exists, that he created the universe, remains apart from it. Uh, according to deists, God does not participate in our universe, does not intervene in our lives. Uh, and um, deists do not worship him, even though they believe in him. Deists explain everything based on reason and experience, including the existence of God. Um, I was reminded uh, just uh, this last week that uh, we have a religion that is based upon deism uh, in our uh, 
in our world today, and uh, it is uh, called universalism. Perhaps you've heard of the Universalist Church. Uh, it is uh, fundamentally a church that is based upon deistic principles. Uh, we had a question that was raised uh, last week about uh, Benjamin Franklin, because we talked a little bit about how deism had influenced the revolutionary, the uh, American uh, revolutionaries and our, our uh, leaders of the revolution here. And uh, I wanted, uh, I had mentioned that uh, Benjamin Franklin in his early years was, uh, was very much a deist and later years was not. And I just wanted to pull up some reasons for that. Uh, Benjamin Franklin writes an autobiography in the uh, 1780s, about 10 years before his death, and he writes in it, some books against deism fell into my hands. They were sold to be, uh, they were, uh, uh, they were said to be the substance of sermons preached at Boyle's lectures. Uh, Boyle, of course, is Robert Boyle, a natural philosopher, chemist, uh, physicist, inventor, one of the founders of the Royal Society. He was in the uh, early, uh, very influential ind individual in the uh, 17th century, and also a theological ess essayist and defender of the Christian faith. And this is a book that uh, with sermons that Boyle had put out. Boyle was never ordained as a minister, however. It happened that they wrought an effect on me quite contrary to what was intended by them for the arguments of the deists, which were quoted as to be refuted, appears to be much, much stronger than the refutations. In short, I soon became a thorough deist. This uh, is from uh, his autobiography, but it was written in 1738 when Benjamin Franklin was barely in his 20s. Uh, I pick up another uh, set of, uh, of, uh, of uh, his uh, quotes and uh, beginning here with uh, Poor Richard's Almanac, Think on these things once you come, where you are going, and whom you must account. Uh, I cannot conceive otherwise than that he, the infinite Father, expects and requires no worship or praise from us, but that he is even infinitely above all we ask and think. Uh, I think vital religion has always suffered when orthodoxy is more regarded than virtue. The scriptures assure me that the last day we shall not, shall not be examined on what we thought, but on what we did. Uh, these are all statements by Benjamin Franklin, uh, given at different times. You'll notice there uh, in the uh, 17, early 1700s. Uh, Although I early absented myself from public assemblies of the sect of Presbyterian Church, um, uh, Benjamin Franklin was raised a Calvinist, and the Presbyterian Church, uh, uh, he joined the Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia. Sunday being my studying day, I never was without some religious principles. I never doubted, for instance, the existence of deity, that he made the world and governed it by his providence, that the most acceptable service of God was doing good to man, that our souls are immortal, and that all crime will be punished and virtue rewarded either here or the hereafter. Though I seldom attended any public worship, I still had an opinion of its propriety and of its utility when rightly conducted, and I regularly paid my annual subscription for the support of the only Presbyterian minister or meeting that we had in Philadelphia. You read that statement in relationship to the early statements about what deism was or its belief by Sherbury, it times very closely what, what we call benevolent deism, not the radical deism of later. Edward Gustav has written about Franklin. He sought conciliation and mediation most of his life on that well-trampled battleground of theology. Uh, and I think that's a very fair statement when you read uh, Benjamin Franklin's life through. So now, uh, let's talk about the religious philosophy of Freemasonry, its founding fathers, as we look at this section. Uh, we're going to explore the philosophy of uh, John Theophilus de, de Lierre and uh, Reverend James Anderson. How did the religious perspective intent influence Freemasonry as we know today? Reverend John Theophilus Delguerre was a scientist, Ang Anglican minister, and a Freemason. Uh, he was a lecturer in experimental philosophy, contributing over 60 articles to the philosophical uh, transactions 
of the Royal Society of which he was a member. Uh, he first worked uh, as a member and uh, being recommended by Isaac Newton for membership. Uh, he actually worked with Isaac Newton for a period of time. He was a member of one of, four of one of the four lodges that formed the premier Grand Lodge on the 24th of June, 1717. He was the third Grand Master in 1719 and three times Deputy Grand Master. Presumed collector of the old charges and editor of the general regulations, which were put out on June 24th, 1721. Wrote a preface in 1723 to the Book of Constitutions by James Anderson, and was presumed the leader of the Committee of 14 who approved the Book of Constitutions on June 24th, 1723. Uh, of the two found, uh, of those that are the founders of, of Rear Grand Lodge, these two individuals, both ministers, are prominent, are most prominently a part of the guiding light of what Freemasonry was to be and become. That is commonly understood by all historians of the period. Reverend de Galliers uh, only had one sermon, which was written on repentance on September 29, 1717, that has survived. He could only be labeled an Orthodox Christian by the standards of his day. That particular re religion uh, was on a passage from Luke, the eighth chapter, the fifth verse. Uh, I tell you, no, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Um, it's the only uh, sermon that we've ever found uh, from him that's been published, uh, although we know there were many others. Um, Reverend James Anderson, uh, Doctorate of Divinity, uh, we do not know his exact date of birth, we think it's 1678, uh, dying in 1739, actually penniless, uh, Scottish Presbyterian minister, historian, most known in the public sphere, not for his ministry, but for his genealogical studies called the Historian of the Grand Lodge. He wrote the only minutes of the Grand Lodge that, have, that we have from 1717 to 1738 and was titled the father of the Masonic history. Um, in some measure, that is a rather unfortunate that he was the only writer because we virtually have all of the history of the early Grand Lodge only through his eyes as recorded in those minutes. Four surviving sermons come to us uh, from uh, Dr. Anderson. One was a dissertation on uh, unity and Trinity, Trinity and unity written against idolaters, modern Jews and anti-Trinitarians. His major genealogical work was the Royal, Royal Genealogies uh, published in 1731, which he worked on for more than 10 years uh, and is a major work, was a major work and well-recognized. He was a compiler and editor of the Book of Constitutions, uh, originally only 91 pages, uh, published in 1723, and later revised in 1738, and it became 232 pages. It's been speculated that it was particularly significantly added to for uh, getting more of a uh, financial gain uh, for uh, republishing it. Work generally, his work has generally been panned in the 19th century by Masonic educators and researchers using modern historical critical methods. Uh, and it's important to use that, that modification, modern historical critical methods. We simply have too little documentation to back up what we know about him except by his own writings. Concerning Anderson's views on religion and tolerance, it can be argued he was a moderate and temperate, though that was not true. Of, it was not true about Catholics who supported the Jacobite rebellion and dissenting sects that challenged traditional Christian beliefs. His sermon of 1712 notes the contagion of skepticism and deism, noting especially those that either think God is the idle specter in the affairs of the world and will allow him no further superintendency over it than a clockmaker and architect. He picking up, of course, the allegory of deism as a, a referring to a clockmaker God. 
It appears evident that Anderson had no quarter to deists or those outside the commonly accepted Protestant Christian beliefs of his day. He was also criticized by his Presbyterian colleagues for his accommodation to the Church of England. All of these are known facts about his life. Um, I'll pull this down so it can be read here a little bit better. Put this down at the bottom, maybe. Uh, why was Anderson picked to take the old charges of the operative stonemasons and update them for the speculative craft is unknown. Did he just offer his services? Was it his antiquarian studies, especially in genealogy, that led him to that? Or as David Stevenson writes in Herodom, and suggests his association with Desgilliers, who had recently went to Scotland and saw how the minutes show the turn from operative to speculative mainstream in that country. Knowing Anderson came from Scotland, maybe it recommended him. The truth is we will never know why Dr. James Ad Anderson was asked to compile the constitution of the, uh, of the Grand Lodge and uh, from the old charges. Uh, Dr. Stevenson argues that the entire purpose behind the new constitution, the first charge concerning God and religion, was to show the inclusiveness of the institution of Freemasonry. He argued or writes that the idea of some common underlying agreement on essentials, which underlie denominational variety in worship, dogma, and church government, involved morality as the key and then brotherly or neighborly love as the key to morality itself. That's an interesting statement uh, because uh, it gets to the, to the question of why the first article on religion was written the way it was and why it was accepted by the Committee of 14 under Del Gay uh, for a publication on June 24th, 1723. Henry Peters, in an article in Ars Quater Coronati in 1987, noted Del veneration for his mentor Isaac Newton, and is quoted as saying, the love of God and neighbors is the religion that may be called the moral law of all nations. Thus was Anderson, and by implication, all the founders of modern Freemasonry seeking to find something common in all religions. Brother Robert Samler, writing in 1722, at the time of the uh, founding of the Premier Grand Lodge, says Masons avoided religion and politics in discussion, yet had a religion. And then he's quoted as saying, the religion we profess is the best that ever was or will or can be, for it is the law of nature, which is the law of God, for God is nature. It is love of God above all things and our neighbor as ourself. This is the true, primitive, Catholic, and universal religion agreed to be so in all times and confirmed by our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. Perhaps Anderson in the year of the Constitution was published tells it best when he wrote a dedication to the Earl of Durkheim one of the Scottish representative peers sitting in parliament to which he acted as his chaplain, in which he reflected about, quote, our zeal for serious religion and true Christianity in general, which is more to be regarded than any denomination or party of Christians under heaven. It's an interesting statement. Can we conclude that in his preaching, Anderson might accurately reflect his beliefs and project his intent and those of the Grand Lodge leadership about what Freemasonry should represent as a unifying alternative to the all too prevalent sectarian and political strife of society? Was the charge on religion deliberately imprecise just exactly to build on that inclusiveness? We know that Jews were admitted to the lodges by 1721, if not before. And Stevenson posits that even deists and universalists could sit under the umbrella of 
Freemasonry. William Hargrove, in a paper titled Deism in the Masonic Lodge, believes that under the leadership of Delier and the Committee of 14, a, a, approved a form of, quote, benevolent deism, unquote, to appeal to the aristocracy, but also to include Roman Catholics who could not at that time be members of parliament, army officers, or hold any public position, yet were welcomed into the Freemasons Lodge. We talk about a stupid atheist or irreligious liberty. What was it? The former having no belief in God and the latter is suggested to be a free thinker, morally licentious or a deist, could both be warned as unacceptable members of the law. I would argue that in fact, that was generally understood to be true, but in practice, uh, as far as deists went, uh, there was not, uh, as we, even today, uh, do, you, do you have a sincere belief in God uh, without uh, talking about denominationalism uh, was simply allowed to stand. And uh, a deist uh, could answer in the affirmative and could join the lodge. Next week, how do we name our religious philosophy in Freemasonry? How does our practice of Freemasonry in the modern era since 6, 1723 reflect that philosophy relative to our ritual and symbolism? What makes Freemasonry appealing for every age and culture? These will be some of the questions that we will try to answer in the concluding section, of Deism, the faith of our founders, and the religious philosophy of Freemasonry. So my brothers, uh, I would uh, ask you if you have uh, some questions, let's talk about them and uh, see what direction things go here for a few minutes. And uh, hopefully, uh, uh, let's see here, get back to uh, where we were at here, find out how to do it. Uh, let's see, share, stop. I'm gonna figure out how to stop sharing here. Oh, I can do that for you. Oh, there we are, right here, right there. <laughs> Find the right thing. All right, I'm going to um, watch the poll, but uh, while we do this, feel free to unmute yourself and ask any questions. All have. right, I'm unmuted. So, um, first of all, Brother Terry, uh, I've sat in both weeks, and I heard some of the questions on last week, so I didn't jump in because it was getting a little crazy. Right. Um, the... Um, uh, the whole, um, the religion and the lodge thing, you know, the idea that, uh, let's say during the revolutionary time during, let's say R Revere, Washington, et cetera, lodges meeting in the back of, uh, taverns, that type of right. thing. Right. Uh, versus where masonry got to over that next hundred years by the late 1800s, where that would just be absolutely you know, mind blowing, right? To a Mason to be meeting in the back of a bar, more or less. Um, you know, I'd heard and, and I'd actually read an article once um, and this was maybe a while ago about the influence and this is probably gonna strike close to home for you um, of the Methodist um, denomination on Freemasonry post civil war. You know, we're, uh, large influx of uh, Christian or Methodist members uh, took Masonry in a uh, more uh, judo Christian or especially Christian yep. mode where things like having a drink yep. is almost immoral. Yep. Yeah, intemperance, right. You can yeah. go to, uh, I've talked with uh, 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 members of the Grand Lodge of Kansas, for example, and they will tell you that uh, the uh, bylaws of the Grand Lodge of Kansas almost directly come out of the Constitution of the United Methodist Church, or what was at that time would have been the Methodist Episcopal Church, mm -hmm. because they were such an influence uh, in terms of uh, society. Uh, let me comment a little bit for you. Uh, yes, they met in they met in taverns only because there was no other meeting place in town. Uh, uh, there, they could not meet in churches, uh, taverns. There was a there was a sense of fellowship that was a part of it. 
uh, often the lodge meeting always concluded or most often concluded with a festive board as a part of it. And often in continental Europe today, there's not a lodge meeting without a festive board with it. Mm -hmm. uh, as we, as the, as Freemasonry became an institution, not a movement, but an institution, then we built our own buildings and we, we had places set aside and that is the traditional move. That's the traditional way in which, well, in religion we begin as a cult, uh, following an individual member, and then we get into a movement, having people joining us, and then we be, then we move into an institution where we institutionalize what we believe and who can belong, and that is what we have today. We have many institutions in our society, and consequently we have the buildings that go along with them to preserve their identity. That. Uh, in in large member in large number is 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 just a universal progression of most societies most most activities. So I guess the the movement from um you know and I and I'm not trying to take it way off the deism channel sure. here but sure uh, the the movement from uh, let's say Washington Franklin uh, these founding fathers these early Freemasons in the U S being deist um, to kind of, you know, where it almost gets mixed up. For, in, in fact, I think even today in some members' minds, it does get mixed up with religion. Like, hey, I went to lodge, therefore I didn't go to church on Sunday, right? Because right? Right. somehow right. I prayed at an altar. Right, yeah, right, right. Yeah. Is, and and is, is, is Freemasonry religion? Of course, uh, we, we say, no, it's not a religion, it's religious. Right. Uh, but there are brothers, and I've certainly met many of them that'll tell me, I go, I go to lodge and that's all I need. Yeah. Uh, but you have to understand that Freemasonry was a leveler in society when everything else was a divider, more especially denominational religion. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when you look at England, uh, Catholics and Protestants and uh, Calvinists, and we can go right down the line, Baptists and, and the fights that went on over there, uh, the uh, the Reformation in 1685, or the Restoration in 1685, finally came about. And we had finally an acknowledgement not only that Anglicanism was going to be the denomination of England, but there were also following it then eventually tolerance acts that allowed other denominations to exist, even though they were not sanctioned in any official sense by the government. Uh, the Methodists came along that way too. I mean, uh, they were, we were, were not sanctioned in any sense of the word. We, they, matter of fact, it got to the place in England. They, there's no Methodist church in England. That word is not used together in England. There are Methodist chapels. There are only Anglican churches. That is, that's a carryover from that period. Uh, interesting. Well, and let, one last thing, and in, in just you know, get off this whole thing with the other folks. Um, you know, that whole uh, migration into institutionalizing, you know, as you described it, we got our own buildings and therefore things became probably more rigid. Uh, I have been led, again, through some readings over time to believe that uh, in a large part that laid very fertile ground um, in that time period for the formation of the shrine um, in the grottos and um, these ancillary yeah, bodies who could kick back, you know, um, and say, hey, masonry is still fun or we can still have our fun, um, you know, that it almost yeah. uh, provided fertile ground. Yeah, masonry allowed them. I, I, though most of those groups are, 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 are progressions out of the late 19th century in a time in which we had, uh, what was I reading the other day? There was more than more than 2,000 different social organizations formed in the 19th century in the United States, more than 2,000. And the grotto and the shrine, uh, they were all part of that in a sense as kind of, yes, the, the fun association, that's true, uh, eventually got into philanthropy, which said that was their cause. And unfortunately, it has become the cause of masonry today it, it, too many masons look at our philanthropy and think that's the reason we exist and it could it could not be farther from the truth but that's that's a whole nother series and i've done a whole nother set of lectures on that but um 
that's what happened. I mean, that's what happened. Others, other questions, my brothers? Anything pick your interest? Most worshipful brother, uh, Terry, I had a question here. Yes, Hans. As we embrace a variety of different denominations and the like, um, obviously the central theme in all of this is that you profess and believe in God, right? So that's right. kind of a right. tenant and that's a, a prerequisite to join masonry. Right. And what I often get asked are, why is that? What is the central theme? What is the really the purpose behind our um, professing well, a belief very, in God? Yeah, a very easy answer to that. You cannot make a vow to you cannot make a vow without making it for, for something greater than yourself. It cannot. It, you have to make it with some injunction greater than yourself. And so our vows are predicated upon a belief in God. But beyond that. They are predicated upon the fact that we uh, have a moral obligation to care for our brother by virtue of the fact that it is a God-given. Uh, it, 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 it's a it, it's a it's a moral it's an ethical and moral uh, unit, and it's institutionalized in our landmarks. Next week, I'll share uh, that a little bit in our own landmarks to see how that that element of deism, a belief in God, is reflected in our landmarks. But I'll argue that even though, yes, it could be called benevolent deism, in truth, it is really, as I mentioned last week, rational theism. And uh, that, you know, I, I, I realize you can maybe interchange the terms, but I have always come to understand it as what I would call rational theism, uh, based on a, a, a reasonable you, understanding. Let me ask you a follow-up question then, in, in that particular context, that um, as we embrace brethren from different denominations, each of them have a unique interpretation of what God and what belief is. Right. Right. Our, right. I mean, and the, practice. The, and practice. Absolutely. So are the guiding principles and morals that are, are associated with their um, commitment towards uh, a God is, is different inter uh, differently interpreted, interpreted by different individuals. Right? It, it, it is, but there is a common thread and the common thread is it could be brought down to the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. There's a moral implication in how we how we act as brothers that's common among all religions. Yep, I'll go with that. And in fact, our landmarks show it as well. So question for you, Most Worshipful. If somebody was interested in doing a little bit more research on the deism, where would you suggest they start? Uh, there have been, well, it's, there have been a couple of books written on deism. Uh, uh, I, I would, I would begin maybe with some of the articles out of Ars Quater Coronati that have been written, because I think they are not only the most scholarly, but give a, a nuanced perspective and a Masonic, with a Masonic understanding, not just a cultural understanding, but how how is this how has this been worked out in masonry? Uh, I had some of those names in the in the uh, Samler and a couple of others, but uh, there are probably oh maybe not a half a dozen papers in Ars Quater Coronati over its hundred and thirty some years that uh, directly impinge upon that or elements of it. Okay, thank you. You've got to ask yourself, you know, what is this religious element of, of our craft and why is it tailored the way it is? And was this in fact, was this an ideal? Was there a specific purpose? And I would argue absolutely. I would argue that out of the milieu of the, uh, of the uh, early 18th century and late 17th century, particularly in England, because that we, we practiced craft based upon Premier Grand Lodge, 
and, and its initial understandings, you cannot separate this movement from its intent in that cultural milieu, which was one of so much division among denominations and groups that Freemasonry was the only tool that allowed brothers of different denominations or different sects to sit down and not discuss politics or religion, the two dividers of the world, as much then as they are today. So the ideal of masonry, and I'll argue this next week, is universal. Remove religious uh, institutionalism and denominationalism and, and picks and quarrels, and remove political uh, antagonies from, uh, the, uh, fr from where we meet. And we have a common level then to focus on how do we do good to others and what does it mean to morally live in a society of brothers? Would that include agnosticism too? Well, I would, I would argue that Masonry is probably tolerant enough of that, is already maybe tolerant of that. Uh, an agnostic simply says, I do not know God. It doesn't say I don't believe that God doesn't exist. If someone says I'm, a, I'm an atheist, I, it would be very difficult for me to be able to vote for them uh, in terms of membership. Now, have some slipped in? No doubt they have. But uh, that's only from ignorance on our own part. And uh, quite frankly, I have argued the first tenet of, of Freemasonry is brotherly love. If there is not brotherly love there, then forget about trying to understand truth. Forget about trying to do charity. If we cannot come together as brothers, the ideal of, of Freemasonry is universal brotherhood. Unfortunately, it has been maligned by ourselves and our own actions time and time again in the fraternity. I'm, a matter of fact, I, there is nobody that has suffered more from it than myself in this last century and our Grand Lodge. We had 14 lodges of the United States and six overseas that said, we will no longer be friends with you in 2002 over an issue that was 4,000 miles away from us. Out of that experience though, I had a number of Grand Masters tell me, I will never allow this to happen again. And it was done out of ignorance, simply following, well, I've got a friend that said, that's got to be wrong. And so I, we're, we're going to just, we're, you know, we're going we're gonna to just fellowship with you. Well, I understand that, but, it, it, but the ideal we were working towards was, what is the meaning of universal brotherhood? That was our ideal. We never gave that up. I never conceded that. Even though at the time it appeared to be a, 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 a terrible defeat, but their own arrogance caused many of the people that participated in that nothing but shame after the fact. And I, yeah, well, have, I, have, no, I have no sadness over that, believe me. I, I, I am fool. sad. I'm I sad that it didn't happen, and it didn't happen the way we wanted it. Yeah, I a lesson was learned. Agree. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, the is it? Uh, let's take that a step further, uh, um, and uh, go back to the universal the universality of the religion that we do allow. Um, could it be that a certain religion or a certain denomination could overwhelm and compromise that very same core aspect that you touched on? Right. And, and it happens in America. It happens every time we put a Christian flag in, uh, and leave it left behind from an Eastern star meeting up on the front of our altar in a, in a Masonic lodge. It's a betrayal of our principles. Well, I've exactly. argued against I've argued against it many times and I've counseled many lodges for God's sakes. I have nothing against the flag, but it is improper in this place at this time with a lodge meeting. We are not specifically a Christian institution. And we cannot be. Agree, agree. 
you know, these are the things. I mean, you know, I, I speak as a Christian minister. I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't disparage that at all. But I, it, it took me a long time, and I'll, I'll share this next week, a little bit of my history of how I came to understand and still be involved in Masonry, realizing that these distinctions not only should exist but our a core understanding of what our craft is, even though we may violate it. And we'll talk about that next week. Well, I hope I didn't run you over with too much information. At some point, you'll have a paper you can read through and, <laughs> and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, digest it. But, uh, I appreciate the questions. Uh, you know, it, 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 too few Masons think about the significance of what uh, what we believe and why we believe it and how it's inculcated into our ritual and practice. And it, it, it's a, simply ignorance on the part of us and, and an inability to teach our traditions and what they really mean and why they're important. And this is happening on a daily basis or daily basis, but obviously uh, we, we witness it in many lodges, in many of our proceedings. And our, it's, I wouldn't say it's getting worse, but it's getting uh, occasionally overwhelming. Uh, in that context, uh, what is your counsel uh, if you see something like happen? What's your counsel to a brother that is uh, in essence facing this well, let, me, let, let me let me let me let me let me let me share an example. A brother offers a prayer at a Masonic lodge meeting and does it in the name of Jesus Christ. I've, it's happened many times in my presence. Uh, I say nothing at the time, but afterwards I try to counsel that brother. Do you understand that even though that may be fine for the brothers that are here, in the context of, of masonry, if we had a brother that was a Muslim or a Jew or uh, a Buddhist, or God knows what else, do you realize how offensive that would be to them? It is not in the spirit of Freemasonry. And, you know, usually they under, you know, if you talk to them, you know, and, and under, do you understand why that can be so offensive sometimes? Words can hurt. Uh, we just had what we have down in, uh, uh, Georgia, was it Georgia where the Grand Master uh, issued that there can be no other volume of sacred law on the altar except the, the Holy Bible, uh, King James Version. Um, well, according to his own, uh, according to his own bylaws uh, of the Grand Lodge of Georgia, that is probably correct. But you've got to ask yourself, is that in the best spirit of Freemasonry when you demand that a brother has to take their vows on a book that they do not subscribe to. I find that uh, terribly offensive. It is not the spirit of Freemason. Well, that yeah. is part of the reason why in Minnesota, when we, we, we rewrote the manual or updated it, I specifically put that it is, it is laudable for the lodge to have the volumes of sacred law on the altar for the brothers there that are present from those religious groups. Not that we put the, 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 uh, the, the square and compass on, on them because they, they go on the, on the volume of sacred law, but in, in terms of the Judeo-Christian sacred law, that is, de that is designated in our Bible. But those volumes are there out of respect for the religions, persuasions, brothers that are in the room and uh it's laudable to do it now do we have to do it no but oh by the way in minnesota what do we require uh, uh, for the volume that a brother takes his vows on it must be the volume of sacred law that he subscribes to it must So it's simply, it's simply living out, practicing our traditions with the best intent of what their meaning is, how we practice them, how, how, we, how, how we have others see them and understand them. There needs to be that congruence. 
Well, we'll talk more about this next week, my brothers, because that's what we'll, we'll get into. Uh, how has, uh, you know, this religious philosophy worked itself out into our ritual and practice? That'll be the whole subject next week. Not, hopefully not too extended a, a, a program, but uh, I think a, a very worthwhile discussion because it's where we have to come to the where I we naturally come to the end of this this entire discussion in these lectures. What what is the religious philosophy of Freemasonry, and how do we inculcate it in our bylaws, our landmarks, our ritual, our traditions? Well, thank you, most worshipful. I'm looking forward to next week for sure. So, God willing, God willing, hope to see you here, my brothers. Yep. Joy, joy to be here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, final uh, words? Uh, well, thank you very much, most virtual brother Terry Tilton. Um, excellent presentation. I'll make sure I'll be at the next one too. Okay, great. <laughs> Good night, my brothers.